Okay, you've probably heard quite a lot about ecosystem services in the last few years. You're probably quite familiar also with cost-benefit analysis. Um, what I've just, we've just completed is uh, a project to try and integrate the two. So I'm just going to run you through that. Um, just to tell you what, what I'm going to say, basically, so then you can check at the end whether I've said it or not. Um, I think there are some strong drivers for adopting an ecosystem services approach, both at policy level um, and also at an environmental level. So it enables more and more environmental impacts to be brought into, the, into decision making. Uh, I think to the extent that it could all soon be a requirement for water companies to take an approach like this. Um, it can be integrated with CBA, um, cost benefit analysis. It's quite hard, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but I think it can be done and it does make a difference, especially when you've got schemes with a lot of environmental impacts, as you often find in the water industry. Um, and finally, water companies and others should be using it uh, much more widely. Of course, we shouldn't try to value everything, and I'm an economist, so it's my job to try and help water companies and others value these kind of environmental Im and social impacts. Um, and you c it's very difficult to try and value everything, but at least by using an approach like this, a framework, it makes what you can and cannot value much more explicit um, and environmental impacts are no longer treated as free, which they are in a lot of cases at the moment. Okay, um, what are ecosystem services? You probably know what they are, but just to remind you, um, basically they're the goods and services that are provided by the natural environment uh, that provide benefits to people. Um, there's the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment came out a few years ago, divided them into four. So there's provisioning services, which are goods or products that people consume that come from the natural environment, like crops, fruit, fish, uh, natural medicines, etc. And we've got regulating services. Those are things that regulate the natural environment, so like air quality, maintenance, water quality, cycling, etc., climate regulation, erosion control, flood protection, and so on. Cultural services, so those are things like recreation, amenity, uh, the more kind of spiritual services, if you like, and supporting services. So those are the ones that kind of underpin everything. So things like nutrient cycling, soil formation, and things, and those in underpin all the other services that are provided. Um, there's been quite a lot of focus on ecosystem services in recent years. So these are just a few of the kind of high level reports and papers that have been published. So We've had the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment I mentioned in the bottom right there. That was 2005. Uh, last year we had the UK National Ecosystem Assessment, that's the one in green. And last year also we had some um, white papers from the government, the Water White Paper and the Natural Environment White Paper. And both of those focus quite heavily on the concept of ecosystem services. What's the ecosystem services approach? Really it integrates ecosystem services into decision making. So. I've written what I think it is there. You might have other ideas, but it's basically a systematic way of trying to bring things into decision making um, and linking those impacts into it to human welfare. So we know that the environment gives us a lot of benefit, but what does differences make to humans and how does it benefit us? And it provides specific tools and techniques for doing that. Uh, it's not particularly new. It's been around at least 20 or 30 years, but I think um, it hasn't been adopted widely because partly because of the lack of knowledge. So for example, the second bullet there, uh, we don't know much still about the links between the ecological impacts and human welfare and the benefits that we derive from ecosystems. Um, CBA in the water industry, a lot of you probably know some of this already. It's widely applied already, already both at a program level, so at the high level program level, and also for individual schemes. And regulators expect it, water companies and others have to provide just cost benefit type justifications for investments. And part of that is incorporating, uh, uh, valuing and incorporating uh, environmental impacts in non-market impacts, if you like. There's some contention at the moment over the extent to which it should be applied. So, for example, environmental regulators say it shouldn't be applied to statutory schemes. Um, so there are some differences. And there were a lot of differences in the last price review, PR09, in England and Wales. So differences, I think, in the level of application, in the methodologies that water companies used, and the level of detail. And I think the point about what I'm going to show you ecosystem services is that it could provide a kind of overarching framework that companies uh, could, could use to try and uh, bring in some commonality and consistency. This is how the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment 
sort of builds up the ecosystem services approach. You don't need to read all the writing, don't worry about that. But basically, what you've got is the ecosystem services down the left. So those are things like primary production. Then in the second column, those are grouped into final ecosystem services. Those are things like crops, livestock and fish. And then in the middle column, we've got all the different goods that are valued by humans. So food, fiber, energy, drinking water and so on. And the NEA groups those into three different categories, economic, health, and kind of social um, impacts. And those are the things on the right that we try and describe and quantify and value. Uh, that was a bit complicated for me, so my slightly simpler diagram has got four kind of categories of ecosystem services. Um, and those give us benefits, financial benefits, social benefits, and e environmental benefits. And I think across all of those, those should encompass the various aspects of sustainability. But I think the, the key point is that with the ecosystem services approach, it's the services that are, um, are of, that are of interest and valued by humans, not the ecosystems themselves, which might be controversial. Um, so it doesn't sit very well with things like intrinsic value, for example. Um, right. Don't worry about this one either. This is um, a framework that we developed to integrate ecosystem services into cost-benefit analysis. Um, and the purpose, well, I can't show you the detail because it's confidential. So, you know, we've kind of developed this and we've been working with water companies, but it's nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. It's all quite basic stuff, really. Um, the purpose is to identify all the ecosystem services that are identified to, uh, um, associated with a scheme or a program to capture those in the qualitative and quantitative terms and then to try and uh, value those if possible. So there's four stages um, moving from the sort of identifying the scheme and the baseline at the top, you always need to start with that, uh, and then moving on to sort of the quality, describing the impacts and, and describing them in a qualitative way um, and then quantifying those as much as possible and various steps around that and then uh, valuing those and including them in the, in the water companies uh, sort of standard cost benefit framework which all comp water companies have a kind of their own cost benefit framework that they've built up and developed so it's important to kind of integrate it integrate the two at the end um, right if you thought that slide was uh, was good you won't be able to read any of this one this one's even more confidential though so I can't show you the detail but basically the important thing is the colors uh, uh, and the rows and the columns so the most important part of the approach I think is to link ecosystem services to the schemes and activities that are typically undertaken by water companies. So to do that we kind of constructed a matrix. Down the left hand side in the columns on the left we've got all possible water company activities. So anything that a water company might be involved in. Uh, and in the, in the columns across the top we've got all the different ecosystem services from the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment. I think there's about 22 altogether. And then you can try and kind of map those across um, so, uh, hopefully the darker colours are the ones where the, the association is strongest. So that might either be green, where there's a positive impact from what the water company is doing on the ecosystem, or it might be kind of pink or red, where it's quite a negative impact. I think yellow is where it could be either or, so it could be positive or it could be negative. And then the point of doing that is you can highlight what the most um, significant impacts might be and take those forward for quantitative assessment and valuation, which then goes into your cost-benefit analysis. Um, so uh, we started off by doing that. Of course, it's only a guide. Most activities that water companies do will be location and scheme specific. So you can only ever use this as a guide. Um, but I think and then if you're going to do it in more detail, you need to look at a kind of scheme specific level. Uh, just to kind of uh, blow up some corners of that and show you in a bit more detail, one of the main points of, of doing, main difficulties we found in doing this is what I've called impact pathways. So that's kind of trying to match what a water company does at the top with um, the ecosystem services and the impacts on ecosystem services at the bottom. So you've got some kind of uh, um, flow between those two things. So to give you an example, um, a water company might, for example, do ferric dosing, uh, wastewater treatment works. That results in um, uh, a reduction in phosphate pollution in the wastewater. Uh, that reduces the amount of pee in uh, the receiving water course, reduces eutrophication, uh, and that ultimately should improve biodiversity in that water course. 
And it's that improvement in biodiversity that is valued by humans. And in this case, it might be non-use values, um, but it could be other kinds of values that, that are valued by humans as well. Okay, just to blow up that matrix a little bit more, this is an example that we did for bathing water. So down the left, you've got some typical uh, investments that water companies might do in the bathing water schemes or shellfish waters, different kinds of treatment they might implement. Um, and across the top, you've got different kinds of ecosystem services. So generally, for these kind of investments, we thought that the impacts would be positive, it would be green, there would be some significant impacts potentially in water quality, um, and there might be some negative impacts as well on things like climate. So that's because obviously a lot of um, solutions in this area might be energy intensive and have lots of carbon emissions associated with them. So that's just one example of how you can apply this and then you can take those most significant impacts forward for kind of uh, quantification and valuation. When we did this, where are the greatest impacts? Well, the ecosystem services that are in, tend to be impacted most by water company activities are those ones on the left. So things like climate, it might be carbon emissions where you've got a lot of capex or opex. Uh, it might be reductions offsetting carbon emissions where you've got things like renewable energy schemes or carbon reduction schemes. Uh, noise, environmental settings, obviously a lot of water company infrastructure is located in quite high amenity areas, so uh, their investments tend to have quite high impacts on recreation and amenity and so on. Air quality, water quality and availability perhaps as well. And on the right, one of the water company activities, the things that water companies do that have the greatest impacts on ecosystem services, and our initial kind of... Uh, review of this application of this framework suggested that it's things like catchment management which obviously a lot of water companies are progressing now and the more traditional type schemes as well around river restoration uh, wastewater treatment water water resource developments and water treatment so there's you know it applies to quite a lot of areas and so there's potentially a lot of impacts that we're either not picking up or not picking up fully at the moment in conclusion just uh, last couple of slides I think there's a lot of advantages with trying to link ecosystem services to cost-benefit analysis. Consistent with government policy, very popular with regulators. They've published uh, papers on it recently. Um, it, the th main thing for me, I think, is that it gives you a framework to try and cover all the potential environmental and ecosystem impacts. So it provides kind of coherent framework for assessing those impacts. There's other ones as well. By identifying what the impacts are, you might be able to identify beneficiaries as well and that might generate funding opportunities um, or more innovative solutions. One of the water companies we worked with was looking to uh, in introduce a number of flood defense schemes, protecting their assets basically from flooding by building concrete bunds around the assets. And by taking this approach, they've realized that I think if you actually build those bunds in a different way, provide green infrastructure around the bunds, rather than, uh, uh, green type bunds rather than concrete ones, those provide a lot of amenity and uh, visual benefits and so on to the local area and those can be incorporated into the CBA so you get a much better cost-benefit ratio if you like and it's more likely to pass a sort of regulatory tests. There are some limitations obviously, there's lots of uncertainty um, both in our understanding of ecosystem services and about how those ecosystem services um, are valued by people I guess. Um, there's, you still can't value everything so um, it's difficult to try and put values on a lot of these uh, less tangible ecosystem services. There's a risk of double counting as well, so you have to be conscious and aware of that. Uh, and there's a lot of assumptions that you need to make. Um, so for those reasons, I think um, it should just be one input into decision making, but it's nonetheless important, I think. And does it make a difference? Well, I think it's probably more evolution than revolution, but um, as knowledge improves and we understand more about the impacts and how those are valued by humans, um, more of those environmental and ecosystem impacts are brought into the decision making process and that hopefully can, can only be a good thing. A uh, couple of recommendations. Um, I think for the next kind of price review, the next damp period, um, companies should, and we're working with some companies on this, try and adopt an ecosystems approach, perhaps in parallel with a more traditional CBA cost benefit type approach to see what difference, if any, it makes and perhaps do them in parallel. I think we need some uh, support from the regulators. Companies are reluctant to try and to do new things if they're seen as kind of the only ones or if they think that the regulators are going to overly scrutinize it. So some support and engagement from the regulators. 
and I think some cross-industry guidance because we don't want to come up with the problems we've had with cost-benefit analysis where companies have kind of, you've got some basic policy level guidance but then companies apply it in very different ways. So I think we need some uh, fully developed, perhaps from uh, uh, Aquir, UK Water Industry Research or a body like that to develop some cross-industry guidance. So that's it. Um, finally, whilst as hopefully I've got across, I'm a keen advocate of the ecosystem services approach uh, and for the wider use of ecosystem services, I'd just like to say be careful what you wish for because you never know what might happen next. Thanks. Great.